welcome today Professor Yael Pat, who is a professor of electrical engineering, uh, computer engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. He holds the Ernest Cockwell Jr. Centennial Chair in Engineering. In 1965, Pat introduced the WOS module, the first complex logic gate implemented on a single piece of silicon. He is a fellow of the ITPLE and the ACM. Professor Pat uh, will give us a lecture on the subject, the microprocessor, where we've been, where we are heading, and what we have to do differently moving forward. I do hope that he got here in a good mood today because he is well known for being a, a highly entertaining lecturer. Professor Pat. Uh, the problem with telling them I'm entertaining is that you raise their expectations, and that's always dangerous, see? The problem with sitting here listening to all these introductory remarks is it gives me 50 million things to comment on. Like when I do something decent and people thank me for doing something decent, I say it's the way my mother raised me. Don't give me the credit, give my mother credit, see? Which you reminded me of. Uh, when uh, when the plane lands in Eretz Israel, it's just a pleasure to just be here, and especially being here in Haifa, listening to the comments about uh, the Technion and the high-tech industry, it's absolutely correct. There's, a, there's a, uh, uh, a coming together that is just incredibly powerful, and you do have a world-class university here. There's absolutely no question that Technion is uh, among the absolute first rank. And it's, uh, it's an honor, actually, to be invited to be part of this uh, dedication ceremony. I'm, I'm humbled by it rather than uh, gory uh, in it. Um, I probably should not talk about all the anecdotes because uh, Ruth has told me 30 minutes, and that's it. They have more important things to do to li than listen to you for two hours. Uh, Uri Weiser, a professor here at the Technion, says, don't get Yale started, because once you get started, you'll never shut them up. And uh, there is some truth to that. So I will start my 30 minutes, or maybe 27 and a half minutes. So what I want to talk about today is a microprocessor. It's this little chip that powers your laptop. If we put thousands of them together in one big computer center, we can solve some of the more difficult uh, problems but not enough of them as yet. So the title I've given this, the microprocessor, this little chip, how do we get to where we are? And what do we have to do moving forward if we're going to deal with the incredible challenges uh, that we see uh, in front of us? So this slide describes what computing is all about and the fact that to get this computer to do the bidding so that you sitting there can surf the web. So you sitting there surfing the web, you're a user, and you have this problem. You want to surf the web. You may know nothing about computers. You probably don't care about computers. But for you to surf the web, the computer has to execute a program to allow you to be surfing the web, and that's the program. And that program needs to be translated into the zeros and ones that the microprocessor can understand. And this is the ISA of the microprocessor that it understands. ISA, Instruction Set Architecture. It's what Intel calls x86. And if you visit their design center in Haifa, they will talk to you about the zeros and ones that separate what the software produces and requires the hardware to carry out the work that the software wants. The ISA, that interface. If you uh, visit the people at IBM, another major facility here in Haifa, I'm telling you this, this confluence of industry and, and academia here is just incredible. Oh, I forgot, I do have to say one thing. The president, he is a professor, and he understands that what, and I wish that some of the deans I have in my university would understand it as well. What a university is all about, and Henry Taub had it right, and you had it right when you immediately said what we need is professors. You had it half right. What you need is professors and students. And what the university is all about is professors and students. 
and everybody else, the president included, it's your job to make it so professors and students can get their job done, which is all about knowledge, advancing it, which is what research is all about, and imparting it, which is what teaching is all about. Unfortunately, there are too many administrators in the U.S. that don't get it. But here at Technion, you do, and I'm delighted uh, with that. In any case, that x86 or that power PC that IBM talks about has to be implemented. And those are the chips. And the chip, somebody designs the structures that are going to implement, and then somebody below that has to design the circuits to implement those structures. And those circuits is what produce the voltage differences that all electrons to go from one potential to another, actually solving the problem. And there are people working at each one of these uh, layers. People who have problems to solve in natural language, like Hebrew or English or Arabic or French. People who design the actual algorithms to solve those problems people who turn those algorithms into programs and all the way down. <laughs> In fact, if I could only speak the language of the electrons, I can't. Most of you in this room are bilingual. You speak Hebrew, you speak English. Some people speak three languages, trilingual. Unfortunately, I speak one language, English. I'm what they call an American. <laughs> If I could speak the language of the electron, what I could do is go up to the computer and go, <laughs> electrons, I want you to write a program. I want you to allow this person to surf the web. And the electrons would say, yes, sir. And they would then take what the user clicking on the mouse would do and surf the web. Unfortunately, I can't speak electron. And the electrons can't speak English. And so I have to go through all these layers to get the electrons to do my bidding. And what we have, some people in this room, certainly people all over the different sub-disciplines of the Technion, people working at each one of these layers in order to make all this happen. The problems, what are the problems? So I've given three examples of the problems problems for the future, problems that we need the computer to be able to deal with. The first one is easy, self-driving cars. 20 years from now, probably 10 years from now, I usually get it wrong when I estimate when it will happen. You will walk into your car, you will sit down in the back seat, your weight on the seat will cause, will activate some mechanism which will say, where to master? Or, we're two mistress, because we can't genderize people who sit in the back seat of the car anymore. You will say, home. And then the computer will look you up, recognize your voice, first of all, so it'll know where home is, look you up in the system, figure out how to get there, and then drive you home. And you can just sit there and read the newspaper or whatever, and it'll all be done. And we'll have that in 20 years for sure. Technology is there today has to be made economical, has to we worry about safety concerns, but that's where the future computer is. At the other extreme is a computer that can think. I don't think so, at least not yet. We frankly do not understand yet, and this is for the, the psychology people and for the neuro people and for the people that really understand the brain to really understand the brain. People modeling the brain, no way. We have a long breakthrough required before the computer is going to be able to think. So in the next 50 years, maybe that breakthrough will happen. I don't know. The middle one, I say hopefully. And if we do our job right in the computer industry, maybe we can, 20 years from now, have a computer that can, in fact, find a cure for cancer. That is to harness the capability that is available to make the computer be able to solve the problem that would take years of computer time to be done fast enough that it could provide a cure for cancer. I use cure for cancer as just an example, uh, predicting weather so that tsunamis don't devastate us. There are all kinds of problems that right now would take a computer a year you don't know, 
If the tsunami is going to hit tomorrow, having a program that will tell you a year from now that the tsunami will hit tomorrow does you no good. Because it hits tomorrow, a year from now, yeah, you can look at the devastation and say, you know, the tsunami was going to hit. What we need is a computer that can predict the tsunami will hit tomorrow and give you that information right now. And that's where we're working to get more and more power out of the computer. At the other extreme is the electrons, the raw horsepower that's going to, if we harness properly, we'll have a shot at curing cancer. The electron sometimes referred to as device technology. We have on this chip transistors. Gordon Moore, a long time ago, predicted the number of transistors that will be on the chip, doubling every process generation. As we understand the instrumentation better, we can make the transistor smaller. As we understand the, the, the silicon better, we can make the, wake, the wafer and the chip bigger, which allows more and more transistors to be on that chip. So smaller transistors, bigger chips, means doubling the number of transistors on the chip. That commonly referred to as Moore's Law. The number of transistors on each chip will double uh, every two or three years. And it continues to happen and has been continuing to happen and will continue for at least another uh, decade. So this device technology. Microprocessors started in 1971 with the Intel 4004. 2,300 transistors, that's all, on a chip. And it ran at 100 kilohertz. Just to put the perspective right, kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, the light that goes off and on and off, goes on and off 50 times a second. A kilohertz is 1,000 times a second. So you're already running 20 times as fast as the light goes on and off that you can't see the light going on and off. It's too fast. But 1,000 times a second. And then 21 years later, and, you know, I wish it had been 18 years later so I could say hi later. But unfortunately, 21 years later, we get the Pentium chip, which, by the way, the first design of the Pentium chip, well-known chip in the computer industry, where was it designed? The Intel Design Center in Haifa. That's right. And the Design Center in Haifa has been one of the gems of the whole Intel uh, community of design labs. People talk about... They have a design lab in Portland. They have a design lab in Austin. They have a design lab in Santa Clara. The crown jewel, Haifa in Israel. <clears throat> Pentium chip, 3.1 million transistors. 3.1. So from 2.3 thousand to 3.1 million in 21 years. In fact, uh, so, Professor, you know what this is? Can't tell what it is, huh? No, 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 it's a key <laughs> If you ask a freshman, he'll get it right. You ask a president, never. <laughs> so this is the Pentium chip, 1992. Three million transistors on that chip. Fast forward 21 years later, we have today. Five billion transistors on the chip, running in the gigahertz range. 20 years from now, Maybe the chip that can help us cure cancer. We have all these transistors. Have we used them effectively? I would argue not yet. So, and this is a nice animated slide, so clearly produced by one of my students. There's no way that the previous slides are all my slides. And one of my students says, you have reduced this incredible PowerPoint technology to the overhead transparency. And that's true. That's true. But now we have one from my, one of my students. So all these transistors to go into this microprocessor, there are all kinds of fantastic things we can do that are difficult. There's also an easy thing we can do, make the cache bigger. So this is the way the transistors have been used. Notice the slope, exponential. That's what doubling every generation means. But notice that what's going on here is, as time has gone by, more and more of the transistors go into the on-chip memory 
because it's easy. Until it gets so silly that you've got this little processor in this huge on-chip memory called the cache. It says, hey, you know, we're embarrassed to sell this thing. So little processing, so much memory. So what do they do? They invent core dual and use some of those transistors to give you a second processor on that chip. And time passes, and once again, so what do they do? Quad core. And that's the way it's been going. Uh, <clears throat> as the number of transistors keeps doubling, they have not been used for the purpose of making the chip more powerful, but rather to simply uh, add to the size of the on-chip memory. So what's it all about? We started out improving the microarchitecture. We did put in a better branch predictor. What that is is not important. It makes the processing run faster. Better branch predictor, the larger on-chip memory helps a little, more functional units, all underneath the hood, all so that the programmer doesn't realize what's going on, but producing better performance until it got too hard. And then we moved into phase two, which was multiple cores on the chip, which is where we are today. We talk about multi-core chips, and the number keeps growing. It's going to get into the thousands before long. Except now we don't know how to program them. Too many cores, too many processes on the chip. We don't know how to program them. They're consuming too much power. There's a limited availability to go off the chip and bring in the information needed to do the processing. Off-chip bandwidth, we call it. And they're already killing us. And as we move forward when we go from identical processes on the chip to variable processes, heterogeneous we call them. And some of the parts of the chip will be reconfigurable. That is, you can turn it from one thing into another thing depending on what the application requires. And some of it will probably have to be powered off because the energy consumption is too great. And we don't know how to do all that. And so what can we do moving forward? The critical message is we need to break the layers. That is to say, all these layers where we have different people operating at individual layers where they don't pay attention to anything except their own layer. I'm an algorithm person. My job is to design algorithms. I don't care how the circuits are working or the circuit designer down here. My job is to design circuits. I don't, could care less as to what they're being used for. That has to stop. That is to say, we need to break these layers, and people need to be aware of the other layers. And if you're aware of the other layers, then you can do your layer a lot better. If we do that, other good things will follow. We'll have more than one interface between the program and the actual hardware. We'll have what I call an organic runtime system, I'm required to keep this within 30 minutes, so I'm not going to have time to talk about runtime systems or ILP cores. But at least I wanted to explain a little bit this more than one interface. That is, the programmer writing the program should know about the underlying hardware or not know about the underlying hardware. All programmers are not created equal. Some programmers take the time to understand how the hardware actually works because they want the utmost in performance. And they will pay the penalty of having to understand better in order to get that extra performance. As I say, they're willing to trade ease of use for extra performance. For them, we need to provide a more powerful engine, we call them heavyweight cores, so that they can write the programs that can take advantage, exploit that heavyweight core. I have a friend uh, who teaches at uh, the University of Brasilia. And she's doing work in chromosome matching between humans and chimpanzees and that sort of thing. She also teaches computer architecture. So her research is in bioinformatics. But she teaches computer architecture and operating system. She knows what a GPU looks like. She knows how it works so she can write the program to take advantage of that underlying GPU. The result is that she can get more performance with one GPU than most people in the field can get programming a cluster 
of the fanciest uh, uh, x86s coming out of Intel. Why? Because she understands the hardware. There are others, others who could care less. They just want to get their job done. Maybe they're writing a payroll. They're content with trading performance for ease of use. For them, we need a software layer to bridge, allowing them to remain clueless, but allowing the hardware to do its thing. So two interfaces. If we break the layer, we have a chance of being able to span that gap. How do we break the layers? As with most things, it starts with education. Tell these people who work at one layer, it's not OK to only understand your layer. If we're going to succeed, we need to be appreciative of all the layers in this transforma transformation hierarchy that I mentioned. So in the freshman course, where many universities teach Java, and the students are clueless. They have no idea what the computer is doing but they memorize and they get the job done. And memorizing is not learning and certainly not understanding. And then the professor discovers that when the student moves on and is clueless about what he or she was supposed to have understood in the earlier courses. Students don't get it. They have no underpinnings. Objects are too high a level of abstraction. Students end up memorizing. What if we start with how the computer works before they ever write a program? And we continue to build on what they know. And if you build on what they know, they learn and they understand. And as they go to each step, from the transistor is a switch. And these kids understand wall switches. They've been turning lights on and off since they were three years old. And that's all the transistor is. When I said that this Pentium chip had 3.1 million transistors, each one of them acts like a wall switch. With 3 million wall switches, you can do some pretty, pretty powerful things. Not as much as we need to do, but some pretty powerful things. And as the student keeps building and building and building, the student sees the layers from the beginning. The student makes the connection of the layers. The student understands what's going on. The layers get broken naturally, and the graduate is ready to tackle these tough problems. So I'm back to my first slide. What do we expect of the future? Self-driving cars, piece of cake. We'll be there, no question. Thinking, I'm less uh, optimistic. But the middle one, curing cancer, predicting tsunamis, et cetera, with graduates that can produce the technology from understanding the layers, maybe we have a chance of accomplishing that. Thank you. <laughs>